A listener note, this week's episode deals with childhood trauma caused by harm, neglect, and sexual assault. It may be triggering for some people. Listener discretion is advised. You are listening to Down Home. The Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children was an orphanage in Nova Scotia that opened in 1921. The orphanage was built because other group homes would not accept black children. The fact that this orphanage came about was a big win for Nova Scotia's black community back then. But as time went on, government guidance and government aid became scarce. The home fell into disrepair. Children were subjected to terrible harm, both physically and mentally. Tony Smith, a former resident of the home, joins us this week to tell us about his journey through the system and his path to activism. Welcome to Down Home, the Nova Scotian experience from two black men. Uh, I am Derek Wise, and as always, we have Jay Jones. Hello. And with us this week is Tony Smith. Uh, what's up, Tony? Hi, how you doing? Good, good. Uh, some of our listeners may recognize Tony from the restorative inquiry for the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Ch- Children. Um, some of our listeners may not be aware of what that is or who Tony is. Um, so uh, to start off, Tony, why don't you give us a little bit of, of uh, history about you? Um, my name is Tony Smith. Um, I am a, a former um, resident of the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children, and I was uh, placed in foster care um, at birth and uh, uh, biracial and um, uh, had some experience that was not positive while in care. And eventually, because of certain things that had transpired, I found myself in a position of advocating and uh, looking to receive justice from what I thought was just me and a few people end up being hundreds of people for decades. Um, and um, for whatever reason, uh, through my life experience, well, I'll be able to share some of it, uh, kind of prepared me for this and not only, but um, when it came to me, it fell on my lap and um, I tried to do the best I could to ensure that uh, and we as former residents and nobody else goes through what we went through and try to deal with the uh, issues uh, that plagued our province for, and it continues around systemic discrimination, institutional racism, because the name in itself, the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children, is uh, something that was put into place because the government didn't really care what happened to black orphans back then. So there's a lot of uh, positive things in regards to that institution and, and the reason why it came to light in the first place. Uh, but unfortunately, there's some, some horrific uh, uh, tragedies and traumas that we have suffered. Um, as just an individual, I, I became to be a father at a young age. And um, uh, nobody really prepared me for independent living. Uh, People like me uh, usually end up being a statistic uh, in jail or drugs uh, and and alcohol issues or whatever. Um, I think because of having a child at a very young age um, and and not wanting my kid to go through what I went through might have gave me an extra motivation to try to do something um, so that my child would have a better life and uh, in doing so, I um, started to speak um, and, and share experience about kids in care. Um, and as a result, uh, certain things uh, had happened that uh, it, it was like, um, I never went looking for anything. It, it seemed to fall on my lap and, and uh, um, many people have benefited from, from uh, this experience that we went through as far as uh, that we're subject to trauma. So. Mm-hmm. I'm here today and, and, and honored that you're interested in, in hearing this here story to help educate some people, not only about what we went through, but you know, uh, as, as black people um, immigrating here for 400 years in Nova Scotia and you know, the, the, the horde uh, um, truth, unfortunately, about racism and how it plagues negative to us and, and, and how resilient we are as a people. And we still try to hopefully look for that day that we're all considered to be equal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, I know the uh, the home started operating in 1921. Yes. Um, the basis of it was, uh, I, I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, 
is that um, traditional ad care uh, resources were not being allocate, allocated for African or black Nova Scotians. So the home was brought about to, to actually accommodate that need. Yes. Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about, you know, not specifically, but just overall, your experience of going through that and and uh, not actually like like you 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 wouldn't know the difference between that particular process and a different process. Actually, I do. I'll give you a, a unique story to that. Okay. Um, so as I was saying earlier, the the home um, is is the pride of the black communities. Um, uh, the, the the people who really got it going was the uh, ABA. African Baptist Association Ladies Auxiliary. It's the AUBA now. But at that time period, and it's in the report that they got tens of thousands of dollars that they went around and 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 you know asked for and and to you know to help with the kids. The land was given to uh, the black communities uh, by the provincial government uh, to meet the needs of they used the term the um, American Negro race at that particular time in 1915. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> to meet the 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 black uh, youth uh, kids, you know, kids in care, as well as education and training and things of that nature. Um, when I was uh, first put into the colored home, well, I was there twice. Um, um, as I said, my, my, I'm biracial, my father's black, my mother's white. Um, when I was born, I was placed into uh, foster care for the first six months until my mother and then grandmother uh, found a place uh, for, for me to stay after six months gave custody to my uh, biological father and stepmother, who I thought was my mother. And um, I went to the colored home when I was a year old for a few weeks until they found residence for me. Um, I lived with them for four years. It wasn't that great. My father, um, 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 it's a little hard right now. He just passed away yesterday. Oh, and, oh my goodness. Yeah, that, condolences, that's right. man. Condolences. No, that, that's, yeah, I'm sorry. I, Many I didn't, condolences. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so anyhow, he was a, a, a fighter. He was very popular and, and um, um, he would also work with the CN Rail and be gone for a few days. But I lived with him for four years. It wasn't, it was a lot of neglect. It uh, wasn't being looked after properly and stuff like that. And my aunt on my father's side, who had a bunch of kids, uh, wanted to take me, but um, couldn't afford it. And my daily ritual is that I didn't know when I was going to eat. So even if I ate or not, had breakfast at home, I'll go to relatives' houses and they asked me if I ate, I would say no, because I never knew when my next meal was coming from. Mm -hmm. So when I went to the colored home in 1965, I also went with my half sister. Uh, I was five, she was uh, three and a half. And um, I remember that day like it was yesterday, I can vividly in detail. And so when I got there, after being there for a couple of weeks and we getting back to about the home for, you know, for, for uh, black kids or, or government not looking after black kids. When I went to the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children, not to be in there for uh, a couple of weeks, they said, you don't belong here. You're not black, you're white. So they took me out of the colored home, put me to a white orphanage. And after mm -hmm. being there for a, a few weeks, they said, you don't belong here. You're not white, you're black. And they put me back into the colored home. So that's a unique way that I found about racism and didn't know what racism was. You know, right. because mm -hmm. my father's black and I idolize and I talk about he's a fighter. But that was also a curse to me because I remember uh, staff members in the home, they, they um, said, you're black. I said, no, I'm not. I said, you're black. I said, no, I'm not. I, I went like this. I said, that's black. And so then they thought that uh, they started getting other kids to, uh, to beat on me, to beat the black in me. So where I was fair complected, uh, I was treated differently uh, because of my fair complexion. I'm a white wannabe or I think that I'm better. If you were dark complected, then you were called ugly names because yeah. You were, you were dark and ugly kind of stuff. You had to pass the brown paper bag test, then you're black and beautiful. And that's by our own people. Yeah. So as I got older, um, a lot of the um, uh, former residents, when we did meet, they would often say when they were kids, because they had been abused by you know <clears throat> people of color, that they were ashamed to be black and they would try to scrub the black off them. So that's the kind of scares that we we had on, on both sides. Right. So yeah, when it comes to... Um, life of what it was like uh, a lot of uh, kids that came into care it wasn't that the parents didn't love them it wasn't that every kid was abused in that nature it was the way that the social economical background mm -hmm. you look at there's not work you look at single parents and you look at they have no place to live or whatnot and if they're looking some sometimes people were sick and they needed their kids to be looked at for a week or two 
sometimes because they couldn't get a place, the kids were taken away from them. Um, mm -hmm. So what was, what was happening with, with that particular part of it, that the home was already set up for failure financially because they didn't have the, the, the monies to, for the new home. And when they were getting kids to come in, the only kids that they were getting money for was kids like me that the government put in that was wards. And then if a, a kid from other problems was there, there was no money uh, given to that kid for care. If there are people in the local communities or the, 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 the region communities in Nova Scotia would drop kids there, there was no other money. So then things were getting drained more. And so part of the, the from the onset, and it's also in the, re, in the report, is that it was more attention being given to the running of that organization than what goes on in that organization when it comes to the kids. The kids were not considered to be, you know, first mm. priority. Right. And so unfortunately, systemically, um, those issues continue. We were always hungry. We were, we were all talking about different stories and, and it, it's, um, you know, the abuse, like, uh, you know, for example, um, me and you, uh, Derek could be best friends. Well, they know that. So every week we would have to be a winter. We're inside the boys' room, uh, playroom. If it's uh, nice out, we're outside behind the hill. And I, me and you would have to fight. And if you refuse to fight, you get a beating. And if you fake a fight, you get a beating. And the only way the fight stopped is that I had to make you cry or you had to make me cry. And then whoever cried was then teased for that whole week. So when they came back, there would be more of a rage to fight. Mm. So for me, I chose not to because I, I was, I was, um, I thought I was older than what I was. I hung with the big boys. I didn't know. But when I went in with my sister, um, I was picked on. I was bullied. I didn't know what all this fighting stuff was. Mm -hmm. but then somebody went and started beating on my sister. And when that happened, I was always protective of her, you know, and, and so I went after this person and I guess I bet the crap out of them and the staff pulled me off and they had a hard time getting me and then I get a, a bad beating. But then I guess I must have got a little reputation because then you had to fight back. That's that's the structure of this, you know, yeah. the, how they got us to operate. So I refused to fight my friend because I know I could beat him. So mm. that being said, I would then um, have to go in, into the woods. And, and get a switch. And if that switch didn't pass the test, I get a beat and then and go back into the woods and get another switch. Because if the switch was old and it broke, you're going to get yeah. a beat. But it had a bend. It had to have that, that flexibility like of the whipping kind of like thing. Like a whip, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yeah. So I, um, I chose not to and I chose to take the beating because I felt that it was wrong. And, and so then they got one of the bigger kids to fight me and, and sure, I felt the pain. I started crying, but then I said, Oh, I got to stop crying. I started laughing because I didn't want to be teased. Um, one thing that helped me with that to, to have less of it was the fact that I was, there was only three Catholics in the home and I was one of them. And we went to Catholic school and, and we went to uh, uh, Sunday school. And then sometimes the nuns would take us over on outings. And when that happened, then I wasn't at home at that time when they were doing this. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of, uh, physical abuse, there was a lot of uh, mental abuse, uh, there was uh, sexual abuse that uh, that we at the time when I was there was an orphan and, and it was by the female staff and, and mm. we didn't think anything differently because we thought it was natural. But, um, you know, you learn later, it, it, uh, it wasn't. But the most traumatic experience I had there was my friend, Anthony Langford. And this is why uh, I'm telling you this because this is what motivates, this is the whole thing behind why we're here today even having this conversation. Uh, he was my best buddy and um, he had a heart condition and he used to go in and out the hospital for surgery. Uh, he had a scar from his neck down to his belly and he was always, uh, everybody knew that you, you hands off, you don't touch him, you don't hit him, you don't do anything. And um, oftentimes we always knew when he was going to the hospital, we get to say goodbye. And um, when he was coming back, we knew, and I sometimes would fake that I'm sick. So I'd be in the clinic to be in a few days with him before he joins general, you know, population or whatever, because right. we're in prison. And um, so um, this Sunday, um, uh, we had dessert, which is a rarity. And my friend Anthony um, wanted to save his dessert to, to watch a TV program. I think it was Tom Jones or Ed Sullivan at the time, and um, in the boys' room. And so... Um, he did, but when we got there, one of the bigger kids wanted his uh, cake, and Anthony refused to give it to him. And um, 
he took the cake and he ate it and he put Anthony in the corner. And uh, at that time we had bookshelves of Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys series. And it was winter time, like in February. And uh, we had our winter boots there and he made the other kids throw books and boots at him. And, and I tried to get out and um, they had kids holding me back. My mouth was muzzled. Now, this is only going on because this is a normalcy that the that staff not supervising us and closing the door. As long as they don't hear too much noise, they're not going to come in. So after Anthony wasn't responding by trying to defend himself, um, and, and he, uh, you know, he was dark complected, but he, he there was a different color to him, and 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 he was just slumped over. And and um, finally, uh, the staff uh, kids went to get the staff. They came back, and and they rushed him to the hospital. And a few days later, he had passed away. Oh, and wow. um, we had told them what had happened, and they said that staff said that we ever repeat that lie that we're going to get a severe beating. So for me as a kid and being subjected to what I've been subjected to, and, you know, and, and then seeing them take his own life and that means nothing, they can take my life because I mean nothing. And, and I just said someday, somehow, some way, I'm going to tell his story. I just didn't know how. I didn't know what that was going to be. So um, I left there uh, shortly after, uh, eight and a half, and I went to live with a foster family and um, things were uh, pretty bad there as well, physical abuse and, and, and uh, mental abuse. There was no sexual abuse, but I learned another uh, form of discrimination, and that's blood sticking in the water because they had their own kids. There's mm. two different rules for us. Mm -hmm. I was there the longest because I was never a troubled child, so it was average like 2.5 kids there over the, the years I've been there, so they had like 40 or 50 some white foster kids. I never got to see my uh, social worker because I was never a troubled child, but the kids who had behaviors got to see so um, I remember at the age of 11, I got tired of these beatings because it was broom handles, mop handles, the old phone on the wall busted over my head and just yeah. beating you with belts and, and for crazy, stupid stuff other than just to, they're having a bad day. Mm. And I remember at the age of 11, my way of fighting back was I wasn't going to cry. And so that became a big thing that every time I got a beating after that, I was going to cry. And I only received three beatings from my foster father. All the other beatings were from my foster mother. She was really abusive to all of us foster mm -hmm. kids. And um, he said to me, he said, I'm going to make sure that you cry. And so this was like in the springtime, summertime, I just had on, you know, shorts and, and T-shirt. And um, he started beating me with his belt and he kept on hitting me. And I'm saying, ouch, what now? But I wouldn't cry. And he said, I'm going to make yeah. you cry. Call me all these names. And he kept on going, going, going. And he did it until he got exhausted. And he actually had to sit on the step trying to catch his breath. And he um, um, basically told me to go upstairs but I wouldn't cry. But one of the most positive experience I ever had in that particular home was at the foster grandfather. Um, he was upstairs and he was a very intelligent man. He used to work for CN Rails. And I remember seeing him walking up the streets sometimes because we're in, we're in the black neighborhood. We're in Africville. That's, that's up around the turn. They just took that house down last year. There's still two houses there. Mm -hmm. And um, he used to walk up to the other part, which is white community and all these people would come up and talk to him. He had his fedora on his head and, you know, stuff like that. And anyhow, I remember um, one day, like his uh, granddaughters or grandkids, used to always prepare his TV dinner because they ate upstairs. And this particular day they got me to prepare it. And I did. And he uh, was watching TV when I went in, I put it out there and I said, here's your dinner, uh, grandfather. He said, well, there's a quarter on the, the bureau, take it. And he wasn't even looking at me. I said, no, thank you. And, and he said, no, there's a quarter on the bureau, take it. And I said, no, thank you. And then he looked at me and said, I give everybody else a quarter. You deserve a quarter, so you take it. All I was worrying about, I don't want you to beat me. I don't know who you yeah, wanted from, you know. Yeah, yeah. So um, I remember um, seeing uh, three rusty dimes I found, and it was outside of his window. And I went up, hey, Grandfather, look what I found. And uh, he said, where'd you get that at? And I told him, oh, buy you window there. So as a curious kid, the next two weeks, I was looking. I kept on finding money, but it was shiny. <laughs> 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 I said, Grandfather, this is you. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's, there's stories I can tell you, but he, he had every time that I got a beating, he would call me upstairs and say, Tony, don't worry about it. You're a good person. You're going to be somebody someday. You're better than these people. You're somebody special. And I could never understand, like, why are you being nice to me? <laughs> right. But um, his uh, other daughter from New York, when she came to visit, she would say that my grandfather loves you more than he loves his own kids. And um, that's he, he taught me that, you know, people say blood's thicker than water. And he showed me that love is thicker than blood. And, and oh, wow. I, I lost him at the age of uh, 12. Uh, and, and I remember that regardless of what beatings I took, what names I took living in that place, the worst thing they ever did to me because of the relationship I, and they, that they knew I had with my foster grandfather is that when he died as an altar boy, I went to serve 
on on the mask and i did and i said to the foster mother to wait for me i want to go to burial site you know with the limousine the family car and she said sure no problem tons of rain i ran out i ran and changed i ran out and when i went outside i seen the last car of the brigade leaving they had already left and i know that this car had to go around like they had to go around a few streets and i may be able to cut them off and i ran these are complete strangers but i just missed them Mm-hmm. This place is like a mile and a half from where I'm at. I know it's somewhere out there up by the right. Halifax Shopping Center. And I'm up the north end on Roby Street and High Street. Wow. And so ton of rain coming down. I'm crying because I, I'm afraid I'm going to miss. And so sure enough, I get to Mumford Road behind Halifax Shopping Center, the corner. And the graveyard is at Mumford. And I don't know where. I was so close and didn't know how close I was. But I, I was so far in my mind. And as I'm standing there, I see the, the family limousine come by. They see me. And they looked at me shocked, but they kept on going. And so I had to walk back home. And uh, it took him about three months uh, before um, they took me out to his gravesite. But the thing is, is that even though physically he was never with me, spiritually, he was always with me. And, mm-hmm. and so I kept that. So that helped me through the, the other years, because all I know at that particular point in my life is that I'm going to care of other people. I don't know why I'm not with my family. And these mm-hmm. people can do whatever the hell they want to you. I'm being trained not to speak because if I speak about the harms, I'm going to get more harm. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm, I had to tell you that because this is where the, the story comes of how this inquiry came to light. So as an adult, as things getting better for me and my family and working and, and, and providing, I went around to speak to child protection workers and I got involved with advocating a little bit as far as just sharing experiences about me being in care. And um I also uh, went on to, uh, like I worked full-time at the Registry Motor Vehicles and I wanted to get into counseling. So I worked at the Boys and Girls Club and then there was an opportunity to work at the Colored Home uh, as casual. And I said, would well, be nice to work there to see the difference between when I was there to what it is now. Right. And when I went there, I, I was really disgusted to find out how degrading that place is. And, and I can see why uh, when I, uh, later when I get into working in counseling, working with youth, that going to the colored home was the last stop before they send you to juvie prison you know if you're a behavior kid kind of thing right. and so um when i went there during that period i got along great with the kids because i learned what not to do and and i also learned the importance that i have to be mindful when i come to work when i'm working with you because i know that you can say something negative that would have a profound negative impact and you can say something positive that would have a profound positive impact that if i'm having a bad day i have no business coming in to give anybody the wrong message or that kind of message. Mm -hmm. But during that period, there was a male and a female staff let go and allegedly um, they were uh, supposedly having sex with the kids. They never ever formally told me this, but when I was doing the speaking engagement, people were saying, well, Tony, you know, if you feel that there's abuse going there, um, you should report that. So I reported to Department of Community Services and Department of Justice, the ministers, and they instructed me to go to the uh, to police, and I went to the the police to 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 do that as well. And and um, they didn't do much because I was the only person. I couldn't remember their first names of the staff and all this and that stuff. But if more people were to come forward, then they would open it up. So, just before you continue, Tony, what time period is this exactly? Oh, I'm sorry, that no, was in that's 1998. Okay. 1998. 1998. Um. So just to back up just a little, Ted, in that same time period, and the reason why a lot of this here got activated um, and, and why I went and said about the, sent the reports and complained about the possibility of abuse mm-hmm. is that the, 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 the media had contacted me because a couple of years earlier, I was part of sensitivity training program for foster parents, and the, the minister at the time wanted me to be there. And then a reporter asked me what was my background. I said uh, an orphanage in a colored home and in foster care. So a couple of years later, I get a call from the media stating that the colored home is looking to get heritage status to renovate the old home funding. Right. And that it'll be nice to have a former resident's perspective. So mm-hmm. I asked, how did you get my name and number? And why are you calling me? <clears throat> so they told me how they got it. So I said, I don't mind telling you my story, but it may not be the story you want to hear. Mm-hmm. So this, I went and talked to my family first and foremost, because now I have my wife, my girlfriend, and now my wife, we've been together 40, 40 something years her and Tess have been friends ever since yeah. elementary, <laughs> <laughs> ever uh, since great primary, right? We got the picture. Wow. So t- yeah. Tess, is, Tess is my cousin, is Derek's cousin, just for all our listeners out there. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry yeah. about that. I was just sorry. It's about all good. That. <laughs> so anyhow, um, 
I, I have my son and I have a daughter now and, and they're teenagers and stuff like that. And, and I said, uh, before I go public, I want to get their permission. I don't want yeah. to bring any shame or guilt to them. Yeah. Uh, I don't care what people think of me, what they got to say about me. But this is my opportunity to talk about my friend, Anthony Langford. Yes. And, and that's why I wanted to, to do this. Because, you know, personally for me, I dealt with a lot of my issues and I, I you know, got a good life and finally got a family. But the thing that bothered me and, and I need a closure was him because uh, that institution made him feel like he was nothing. Mm -hmm. Special to me. I love him. You know, so I um, I got the blessings from my family and I went public. They wanted me to get somebody else to cooperate. I did the story in September of 1998 and the person re remained anonymous. And uh, when I told the story, um, I thought that was it. And I thought that people would say negative things or call me whatever because of the abuse and all that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. But what I didn't realize, I started getting a lot of calls from the reporter stating that a lot of people are calling in and thanking me and, and stating that for the first time in their life, they're, they're sitting their family members down to say that they were in the colored home and um, that they appreciate that. And then more people started to, to, to speak about the, the, the harms and speaking publicly. And then um, there was a, a group of people from Troll that got a lawyer here locally to take legal action. And when I heard that, I contacted the, the, the lawyer because now I'm thinking that what the RCMP had said in, 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 in 98, that if more people came forward, they would do an investigation. Right. So I, I contact them and then I became, I, I uh, the lawyer, I became part of a uh, found uh, actions against the uh, colored home, the children's aid society and the provincial government. And then time was going by stories were coming out and it didn't really get any traction. Like it just, kind of went did until 2012. So that's 14 years later. Mm -hmm. And um, during that time, we formed a, a group called Voices, Victim of Institutional Child Exploitation Society, um, to advocate on behalf of the, the former residents of the colored home uh, to, get a, to get justice and to also look at a public inquiry. Uh, we met and had our first retreat in 2012 in the uh, uh, Upper Hammonds Plains in the Emanuel Baptist Church. It was a four day event. Um, people uh, from across Canada and ourselves, I think there was uh, 32, 33 in total. Mm -hmm. And um, the eldest being 86. And um, when we came and, and because of my experience with mental health, I, I often did sessions of uh, stress management. And so right. I wanted to try to make the environment as comfortable for people that they didn't know pressure whatsoever. If there's triggers and things of that nature, you know, how we can deal with that. So um, that was quite an eye opener because uh, when we came together, we didn't even know each other. And, and the tension, the anxiety, the pain in people's faces, mm -hmm. anger, the frustration, this like, okay, and now what is this? The isolation, like, because we don't talk to each other. And mm -hmm. um, during that four day event, uh, there was a lot of uh, crying, singing, praying, uh, laughing, and when we went around our sharing circle and we used this, um, this is a, a replica of Sankofa, mm -hmm. uh, our talking piece. It's uh, from Ghana. It's a bird uh, moving forward with, with his, his turn around with a beak in his mouth. And that beak mm -hmm. means knowledge. And it's not taboo to go to learn from your past in order to move on in the future. But when right. anybody was holding this, this was their time. This was their space. And they could speak or they could pass and don't have to speak. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, when it got around to the fourth day, uh, it, um, everybody started to find their voices. Everybody was now speaking. They were comfortable. There's no quivering in their voices anymore. We no longer victims. We were survivors. And um, this, uh, you know, through this, uh, the, the the elders said, Tony, we want you and voices to continue fighting for us because we'll never see the day of justice. And that we have complete faith and trust in you guys because uh, um, you don't have to check in with us. You don't have to ask us for anything. We know that you always have our best interests at heart. And that was quite uh, an honor um, for mm -hmm. us to come together. And, and what we wanted to do, um, you know, was to make sure that no other kids go through what we went through. Right. Uh, that we receive justice, that people understand the harms and to learn from these harms and, and to, um, to do things to educate people, but to, you know, do no further harm because there was a lot of former residents that felt guilt and felt shame because what I was telling you, you know, there's harms that, that they have done to each other. And, mm -hmm. and um, you know, why I didn't do it. I, I don't ask me, I, I'm, maybe I'm hard hit it. I don't, I don't understand it, but I can understand the pain because I know 
what I would feel like when I seen and heard of some of my friends that have passed away that I'm supposed to fight, I would feel that I contribute to that pain too. Yeah. So it's mm-hmm. very important that we say no matter what we do is to do no further harm and to um, to have people join our journey to light. It's, it's a candle that uh, that anybody, doesn't matter who, you know, that we're trying to find the truth or trying to get transparency. We're trying to make sure that nobody else goes through what we're going through. If you want to join our journey, join our journey to light. And that's why it's, uh, you know, the title of the book, the, the report, Journey to Light. Oh, okay. Different way moving forward. And it shows yeah. every time that we met with government or different other organizations and whatnot, after we talk about what we're doing, we ask, do you want to join our journey to light? And symbolically, now they're, they're, they're a part of our community. Now, I can kind of see where this restorative pro- approach was adopted by the inquiry. I understand now. But um, mm-hmm. can you just kind of talk a little bit about that? where the the restorative approach came from okay it came from what i was just saying to you the mantras that we had had join i during to light uh, nobody left behind do no further harm and um when it came time for the inquiry of course the previous government under dexter um was opposed to this uh, the uh, leader of the opposition party steve mcneil at the time and the other opposition uh um uh jamie bailey uh, said that if they were to get into power, that they would grant an inquiry. Uh, McNeil and the Liberal parties got into power. And uh, the first interview that he had uh, when he won that night, and they talked about priority, he said to uh, they have an inquiry from Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children. Um, I, I got a call from him shortly after that by uh, uh, his uh, secretary and stating that was the first external appointment that he wanted to make sure that this inquiry is priority for him. And when he met, it was just me and him. And he said that um, he wants uh, voices, us, uh, the former residents, to select the members of the design team to come up. If we want voices to come up with the terms of reference. And he wants voices to have an inquiry that's in keeping to what we believe to do no further harm, that he doesn't want it to be perceived as government's interference. So he was true to form. And what we found is that with your traditional public inquiry, you have a retired judge looks at all the documentation, makes all the recommendations as to what they think is best for you, but where's the first voice? So right. we want to have this inquiry that the first voice, the people who are affected the most, be a part of every part of it, no matter where it goes. Mm-hmm. So I became um, a commissioner. Uh, we, we got the public inquiry uh, granted in the protections of under the law. Um, so instead of having a retired judge, we had a commission of council of parties. Um, Two voices members, me and, and Jerry Morrison, who's a voices member and a former resident, was commissioners there. And I was um, co-chair with the chief justice, um, was the other co-chair. And we had members from the black community. We, as voices, asked um, the government to ask uh, the, the chair of the uh, Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children to be a part of it. Because this was this, our process was not name and blaming or shaming. Our process was to look at the harms that were done, how we collectively can work together to take that negative and put it back into a positive because mm-hmm. the colored home was considered to be a shrine of success right. within Nova Scotia. And, you know, um, so that's where this mindset came from. So in order for us to do that, we had to do it in a way that we we went, we had um, um, the deputy ministers from uh, education, health, community services. Um, uh, the RCMP, the HRP, um, members of the AUBA, the African Baptist Association, the Colored Home, members that were closely connected to Black community, human rights. So we, we started that as, as a, a body, and we had staff that we hired for the RI, that we went out and we had sharing circles with all these different groups. And so it's not a question of us coming to you and saying, this is what has to be done. It's a question about this is what we've learned. This is what our experience have been. What is it in your policies that affect it in a negative way or that needs to be changed to affect it in a positive way? So once they start to realize we're not coming here with a bunch of lawyers and putting you under oath and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Then, you know, then they, it's that aha moment. And then you start realizing that so many people are so passionate about doing the right things. And they know that for, for decades, what they're doing in community services and all these different places or child protection, it, it doesn't work. It's broke. But the people can't really change because the top down says this is what you've got to do or you lose your job and all those kind of different things. Mm. 
So what had happened is that they, they realized that the biggest mistake they were making is that all these different departments, all these different uh, uh, stakeholders that are, have a part of a child in care's uh, life are working in silos. Oh, right. And it's more system-centered than human-centered. Human-centered. Well, that's yeah. what this whole process is about, and these are the, the, the things that we have done. So in order to, to do this, instead of waiting for the traditional public inquiry and making all these recommendations, we were actually building those relationships in real time. Oh, okay. We were actually making changes in real time. And one of the things that happened like in, in real time, I'll just give you an excuse, is that we had heard from government 18% is, uh, that are in care are African Nova Scotian. Another 17% are biracial. And then there's fees. I go, I said, oh, wait a minute, excuse me. Who made that difference between? <laughs> I said, because mm. as far as society is going to tell you that you're black, regardless of what, you know, by, like myself, I already told you at the age of five. But yeah. You know. yeah. So um, I said, I guarantee you that there's nobody of color that was on the, the, the senior policy planning committees of government to make that decision. So sure mm -hmm. enough, I said it a few times and then they actually went out and, and, and got permission from the union to do all they got to do to specifically hire a black person in that position. Right. As a result of what we were doing, there were uh, people of color as well indigenous people put to the bench. As a result, mm -hmm. just now, you heard that there's people of color being put into uh, deputy positions and uh, deputy ministers positions and things of that nature. There's a lot of things that we have done already um, internally that people are not aware of because these are things that are behind the scenes, building those relationships, and we don't know exactly how it's going to go until we have those conversations. Yeah. So depending on what issue you're working on, it may be only one or two sessions. And yeah, mm -hmm. you got it. But there may be five or six or something else in order to get it. So once you establish that trust, and that's what's very important, that yes, we can do this, then people buy into it. So I remember one session that we had with, because uh, I'm also uh, a member of the um, co-chair of the Reflection and Action Group. And what that is, is a group made up of, of deputy ministers within government and with it was council members and voices because we're, we're still there. And we used to meet on a, on a monthly basis to find out what's going on and who needs to do what within your department and how we can do all these different things. And... After we, we did a, a, a brief with the premier and then their ministers and the councils, like there was a big room of us, there was a, a few uh, grown men. I got very emotional yeah. and, 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 and thanked the former residents, said it wasn't for your, your, your bravery and your courage three years ago. We would never, ever think of changing the environment mm -hmm. within. And that's what this is all about. It's not so much who's in power. Mm -hmm. It's changing the culture within. So it doesn't matter who comes in power. This is what's in place that is focused around the human center approach. Yeah, and right. so one of, you know, so these, these, these are some of the things that like uh, family learned decision-making processes, um, empowering communities. And the first uh, community that we went to was East Preston mm -hmm. and um, COVID kind of messed things up. But instead of government coming and saying, this is what you need to do for the kids, the community say, okay, Here's our child. This is their needs. This is what we need. So you come in as a resource, not somebody dictating as to what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when, when, when we start there, every community is different. So they'll have different issues of what they want. And then they structure around that going through this, here, this policy. So it's more empowering people. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening to part one of Reflect, Restore and Redemption on the Down Home podcast. Make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss part two of our conversation with Tony Smith as he tells us what has happened since the Restorative Inquiry published its report. The song, Breaking New Ground, from The Breakdown.